All right. Well, welcome to another YSS Let's Talk Live. We are live, live here on Facebook. Um, so I tell you what, for those of you who are tuning in live, uh, you see a little chat box down there. Please chime in on those chats. Um, we love to comment on the questions, uh, comment on the comments too. So again, please take advantage of that. If you're watching this uh, recorded, share, because we've got a couple of very, very special guests with us tonight. We have uh, Elizabeth Patton and, and Jamie Yowler with us. So welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Can wave? Okay. So yeah, I know this is weird. We're not in the same room. We're not able, you know, talking. And uh, you two are experts um, with, uh, well, IHYC. Did I get that correct? Yep. Okay. So IHYC, Iowa Homeless Youth Centers. And for anybody who knows anything about um, uh, child welfare or, or working with youth or working in the system, there's a lot of abbreviations. So I know that we might throw some of those out tonight. So please, if we use abbreviations, we'll try to, we'll try to spell it out. Uh, before we go too much further, my name is Rusty Johnson. Uh, I'm a YSS prevention specialist. And so I go into the classrooms and I teach a lot of drug education, um, sexual health education. And I've been working for YSS now, what? I think I just celebrated a few days ago, my fourth anniversary, fifth anniversary with YSS. And when I first started working with YSS, to be honest, I'm going to put it out there, I was overwhelmed. Um, YSS has such a large kind of overarching umbrella with so many different community services. I mean, if we want to look at different community services, we could talk about like what I do, go into the schools and do sexual health education, drug education. Um, there, there's uh, a whole bunch of different prevention services. We go into the homes and we do in-home services, mental health services. I mean, there's an entire sector of YSS all dedicated to mental health services. Uh, foster youth, alumni services, homeless services, out of home placement, uh, community advocacy. There's a great programming or program that I hope that we can get the specialist on for a YSS. Let's talk about mentoring. So if you want to mentor a youth, you can get out there and all of these different programs is what I was kind of bombarded with when I first started working with YSS. And again, it's overwhelming. So when I first heard of your program, I heard it as I believe, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but 612, 6. Yep, a lot of people call it 612. Mm -hmm. Okay, 612. Okay, so I'm right. So 612. And I was like, well, what is that? Well, it's in Des Moines. I live in Des Moines, although YSS is headquartered in Ames. So I was all excited. And then I heard about IHYC. And I was like, okay, well, then I found out those two are connected, as I believe. And then I heard about YOC. And, and I guess that's connected to, so we have Youth Opportunity Center, if, I, if I'm correct, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. We have Iowa Homeless Youth Center um, or Youth Shelter, which, um, and then we also have, of course, it all funneled into YSS. So Elizabeth, can you give, just clear it up for me and anybody that's watching this, give me the 411 on that. Yeah, it definitely can be confusing if you're looking um, or first learning. Uh, so YSS is our parent organization where uh, Iowa Homeless Youth Center is a community-based center of YSS. Um, and so Iowa Homeless Youth Centers has a variety of programs, uh, several that you mentioned. We have um, treatment programs, we have transition services, things like that. Um, and then our Youth Opportunity Center um, is our building located at 612 Locust Street. Okay. Right? 612. So um, the youth started that um, and we just kind of kept it going. And so, yeah, a lot of people say 612. I just can't put that as my title. So, <laughs> and, 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 and I love it. And that actually did clear it up quite a bit. So it is all interconnected. Yep. Correct. Okay. So it's all interconnected um, location in Des Moines. And, and again, I, I always say this and I forget with the YSS let's talk, but I want you to remind me later on, you said that youth started this. Did I hear that correct? Um, sorry, what did you say? So did you say that the youth uh, had an influence in starting oh. the, the center? Yeah, we um, the youth were actively engaged in planning for our, um, it used to be at a different center located downtown in the basement of a parking garage. And it was um, it was what it needed to be, but um, we were very thankful to purchase the space at 612 Locust Street. 
Um, and the youth helped us in designing what kind of hours we wanted and things like that. And the Youth Opportunity Center just kind of felt clunky to them. Um, and 612 was just like a very easy way to just say, like, hey, I'm heading down to 612. Or um, they would refer to staff as the, the staff at 612. And it just kind of caught on. Okay. Okay. So now, okay. Now, now we got that out of the way. So we, we've got, you know, again, that was my confusion, but I tell you what, um, if it's my confusion, usually other folks uh, are, are asking that same question. But now that we're talking about the Iowa Homeless Youth Center and, and YOC, um, can you, can you explain some of the services that you provide and, and, and what IHYC and, and YOC does? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, Iowa Homeless Youth Center um, uh, serves uh, transition age youth from 16 through 24. Um, and some of the YSS programs go younger than that, but we really focus on that transition age here in Des Moines. Um, and so our Youth Opportunity Center hosts um, our basic need center, which is, um, we call it our drop-in center, um, which is the hub for basic need services and mobile outreach. And then we also have um, our aftercare department is located in that building with our development team, um, mental health therapist, as well as our post-secondary education program. Um, and then uh, because we're a community-based program, we also have different locations inside of Des Moines. So we have our Lighthouse um, Center, which is a maternity group home for individuals who are parenting and pregnant. Oh, wow. um, and then we have a rapidly housing program for both single young adults as well as um, parenting and pregnant young adults. Okay, so so there's different locations within Des Moines. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, I know it makes it probably a little bit more confusing, um, but we, we do have uh, one location at the Lighthouse Center, which is um, we have duplexes for all of our parents and families to live. And then the rapid rehousing is scattered site. So those case managers are um, going around to those individuals in their apartments and providing services. Um, and then the Youth Opportunity Center is kind of the hub for all of the other services, um, okay. including our uh, drop-in center and emergency bed program. You know, so yeah, you did make it more confusing for me because, you know, you have, oh my goodness, you, there again, so many services with YSS. And I'm not saying that, you know, because I love YSS and the, but there are so many outreaching services. And now, even within IHYC, the program that you work for, there's, there's fingers. And there's and there's different services as you were just talking about. And Jamie, I want to bring you on board here because you have kind of a specialty within this umbrella of just IHYC that we're talking about. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but your 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 uh, your title is the emergency bed program coordinator. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. Rusty. Okay, so now can you explain a little bit more about what exactly that means? Sure. Um, so within our Youth Opportunity Center and at Iowa Home of Youth Centers, there is an emergency bed program. Uh, for the emergency bed program, uh, it allows for nine youth uh, age 18 to 24 to have a space um, where they can stay in their own room uh, and for uh, help them work on their self-sufficiency. Really? So can you, so nine youth? Is that what you just said? Nine youth. So up to nine youth, you can provide beds for. And is this? Uh, and let me go to a backstory real quick. Um, just what a few weeks ago, Jamie, I walked in to IHYC, and yeah. and yeah, you and I had my mask on, and I was just dropping off supplies, and I had never been there. I had never seen IHYC before, um, and I was blown away with the atmosphere. I guess you would say of it all. Um, there's some lights around. There's 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 like an art center. There's and maybe we can talk about that a little bit later on. Yeah. But you were just talking about self sufficiency and the programs that kind of IHYC is set up. That environment that I saw is set up to accommodate. Uh, can I cash in on that a little bit, or can you yeah. can you talk a bit about what what that all's what that's all about? Sure. So I think that uh, our agency YSS in general does a great job at focusing on, on self-sufficiency in a lot of our programs. Um, self-sufficiency to me means that we're empowering our youth with skills and resources to be able to make the decisions and develop their own path uh, so that they can decide and shape what's best for them. 
Uh, for me, in my role as an EBED program coordinator, uh, I have to use case management where I meet with them weekly at least to talk about their housing, their education, their employment, their health, life skills, uh, and um, supportive relationships, which I think, uh, especially that last one, are key in shaping that path for self-sufficiency. So how long, and again, I'm, I'm just asking questions that I have here, but how long are youth typically uh, at IHYC? So um, it depends on which program they're participating in. Okay. Uh, but for the general uh, participant who's maybe at the Youth Opportunity Center, um, it's hard to kind of put a timeline on what their stay looks like because they're just dropping by for services. Sometimes for 90 days, sometimes for less, sometimes a year. Uh, wow. Of, um, we've had some participants who have come in and out of our services uh, as they uh, needed to. Um, but for our emergency bed program, the typical stay, I, or I would say, would be 30 to 60 days. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of a goal as well um, to make sure that the youth are, are executing their own plan for self-sufficiency. Self uh, and uh, making sure that we can serve um, a population that is of extreme need in our community. Um, you know, having just nine beds uh, that we're very thankful for also can be a limit because we see other participants in need in our community. Um, something that we will never do is try to rush someone out the door. Um, something that I can pride in every day uh, is making sure that we're setting a youth or participant up for success. And that means permanency in, in, in housing, typically, or uh, a, a path to permanency in housing and success. Yeah, and we were just, I mean, Jamie, we were just, uh, I, I, we did a special kind of YSS Let's Talk. I don't know, maybe it was two, three weeks ago, and it was on a Giving Tuesday. And we were talking about the need for folks to give and, and kind of help out. And you just said exactly what we were talking about, the need um, that we have for folks to be able to yeah contri contribute financially, but also uh, volunteers, a bunch of different things. And again, I'll go here. If you want to find out more about that, check out www.yss.org. But the need that you just talked about that, yeah, we, we don't kick out youth. We don't do, you know, it's an ongoing service and it's an ongoing program. And that takes, that takes resources. Right. It takes, it takes a community effort and it takes. So bravo, Jamie. Thank you so much. And and now as an e-bed coordinator, let me also ask you this. Have you been able to keep the emergency beds running like yeah. through all of this this crazy time right now? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, obviously, a lot of organizations uh, throughout our state, community, and the nation have had to make hard decisions. Um, thankfully, uh, due to the planning of our staff and team, we've been able to keep our emergency shelter open uh, to continue serving these youth. Um, a lot of our other systems um, have uh, systems programs, excuse me, have been impacted, um, and we've had to adapt uh, how uh, our staff engage with those participants. But uh, for the eBed participants, it does look a little bit different on the day to day. The staff are assisting by. Uh, conducting more um, cleaning, uh, de uh, like a, a better cleaning routine, including sanitation with, you know, different supplies and um, also conducting um, just daily health screenings, making sure they're not feeling symptomatic or ex experiencing anything. And, and if they are, uh, we've been able to assist them by navigating um, the online resources that the state has provided or uh, making sure we continue to uh, assist them in getting access to the health and mental health needs. So, so let me also ask this then. I and 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 so, Elizabeth, if you can cash in on this one for me, I also understand that there's a drop-in center, correct? And can you explain first off yeah. what drop-in center is? Second off, uh, you know how's it been affected? And, and how can folks help out? So I know that was a loaded question, but I'll throw it at you and, and you can yes. go for it. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think I always forget that drop-in is kind of a weird term for people. I've been in this field too long, um, but drop-in, the term literally just means that anybody who needs something can drop by and get exactly what they need in that moment. So 
Um, the drop-in center is kind of that, um, tends to be a first step for youth when they're accessing services with IHYC because it is so easy, it's completely low barrier. Um, individuals can come in and um, grab um, some food, something to eat, hygiene supplies, um, as well as work with advocates on those goals that they have on like getting a job, finding housing, um, anything like that. Um, so yeah, when we say drop-in center, that's synonymous with the Youth Opportunity Center. Our, the Youth Opportunity Center is our drop-in center. Um, and so it's just that hub of um, laundry, showers, hygiene supplies, um, food. A big one is our meals. Uh, we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, for our individuals who are food unstable, and we have a food pantry that they can take out with them as well. Um, and then yeah, all of our staff are just available to help as needed. Um, we have had to uh, close the, because a lot of the youth would come to the drop-in center to hang out. Um, we also want it to be a safe place for youth uh, to hang out in the Des Moines area. There's not a lot of places like that for individuals, um, especially if they're um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness. And so we um, wanted it to be that living room kind of feel um, and youth did access it like that. And um, that just made it hard to adapt services with social distancing. Um, so the drop-in center is closed for like the hangout time, um, but we are able to provide meals to go. Um, youth can still grab supplies from us. Um, we just uh, grab what they need and grab it, give it out to them. Um, if a youth is needing something, we can um, meet with them in our conference room so we can still have six feet distance um, a lot of our youth are really comfortable chatting um, outside. So we've done a lot of that too, and just had kind of informal check-ins outside with the youth. Um, so we're trying to figure out those creative ways of uh, connecting with them um, while maintaining social distance, as well as um, we ask a lot about those screening things that Jamie mentioned. Um, if the youth is feeling unwell, um, we help walk them through that test Iowa site and um, take temperatures, things like that, whatever we can do to assist. Um, despite the drop-in center being closed. Do this go a little bit more deep with the COVID situation. Have you seen mm -hmm. like direct impacts with the youth and COVID? Uh, and, and Jamie, you can jump in here too. I'm gonna throw you both in here. But have you seen seen some impacts there that it, that's been happening that you've had to deal with and kind of adapt? Mm -hmm. I think for the drop-in youth um, specifically, it was um, just a lot of uncertainty and that anxiety and um, kind of that mental health toll that it takes on um, everybody. It's a, definitely a shared trauma, but we know that it impacts individuals differently and our youth are already experiencing so much struggle and it's just um, most of them are already in active stages of crisis and this pandemic is just um, a really big thing to handle and take on. Um, and so I think that's been the, the biggest hit um, that I've seen um, since COVID. And I think uh, we also saw some direct impacts in how we developed the self and execute the self-sufficiency plan or their case plan. Um, for housing, a lot of our participants were in the process of moving into an apartment you know, when COVID started, you know, working with landlords, viewing apartments, determining if they're eligible for those apartments. And those communications became harder because a lot of those organizations or landlords were in an office setting and were no longer working or were trying to work from home and figure out how those processes work. Uh, and also, um, a lot of our youth rely on community resources for housing assistance. And a lot of those programs even still are on hold. Um, and we're doing our best to continue to assist them as they navigate uh, their housing needs. Um, but I think Elizabeth would agree with me, one of the largest impacts we saw for our participants was employment. Um, a lot of our youth uh, are, you know, uh, have employment insecurity. Uh, a lot of our youth uh, are working part-time, some even full-time, um, but saw some layoffs or loss in hours in, the, in those impacts. And, um, Obviously, that's uh, a hindrance to their, you know, everyday plan uh, and, and, and kind of what they saw is uh, their path to self-sufficiency. So adding to that stress and environment again, where um, not necessarily always being in, in crisis, but um, just making it that much more difficult for them to continue on, you know, their their perceived path. 
So you've talked about like self-sufficiency, you've talked about education, you've talked about jobs, you've talked about so many things that it sounds like you all kind of coordinate to help the youth out and to give them the skills to connect them with the folks that do, that can help, that are maybe experts out in the field. And just like I was talking with Jamie about um, when I walked in. And I was just uh, seriously, and and I know because of COVID, I wasn't able to take a tour of the entire facility, but from what I saw was just incredible. And we talked about that a little bit earlier about kind of like a, there was one section that was almost, to me, it looked like almost kind of a cafe-ish area or an art area. There was one section that looked a little bit different. So do, uh, I think we might have some pictures to throw up here and Elizabeth and Jamie, if you can kind of give folks maybe a, a little virtual tour about what this is all about. And then I want to talk about after this, if folks want to help out with this and they want to get involved, what they can do. So first the pictures. So what are we seeing here? Awesome. Um, yeah, this is the uh outside of 612 and so this is um i'm sure people have driven past this if they're in the downtown area but we're right off of locust street between 6th and 7th um, we have a very uh bright big uh sign that says 612 uh hangs out from the street and we just got new doors that are bright orange as well and so you definitely cannot miss us and we really wanted it to be that way. We are not ashamed of who we are or who we serve. And so we're very thankful to be right in the heart of downtown on a very busy street. We're also connected to the Skywalk. And so it's just very accessible for our youth accessing services, as well as for our volunteers who also engage in our programs. Um, and so uh, this is when youth walk in the front door, this is the first thing that they see. Um, we have our front desk area that um, they can sign in and circle what they need and let us know instantly that they um, might just be here for laundry and we can help them with that or um, any of those kind of uh, other basic services. The front desk area is also important because it stores our mail for the youth. We're a mailing address as a lot of our youth are bouncing around from place to place. Um, it's really important to have that stable address when you are looking for housing or uh, employment. You always have to put down an address and you have to be able to accept that important mail so we can be that for them. Um, as well as storage, um, even uh, when you're staying at some of the other shelters in the area, you tend to only be able to have a certain amount of bags. And so if the youth isn't able to be in our um, emergency bed program yet and they're just one of our drop-in youth, um, they can store their belongings with us secured in our front desk area and access it throughout the day. Um, then it goes into our, um, I call it the living room, I guess. I don't quite know what to call it. This is partly what I saw too, that I was just like, say what? This is awesome. The lab. Yeah. The lab. Um, and we, we wanted it to be like really welcoming and inviting. Um, we chose that kind of low frame furniture just so it can keep that open feel and space. Um, we can arrange those couches how, and we do arrange them in various ways, just to kind of depending on the activity that we're doing. Um, cause we do life skill classes in this area. Um, we've done, uh, right before COVID, we did a fun talent show with everybody. And so this space, it's, um, hard to see in the picture, but it's very large. And so we can kind of use it however we need in that space. And then right behind those couches is our computer lab. Um, so we have, four computers that the youth can access, um, work on job applications, um, uh, applying for public assistance, kind of any of those things that um, the staff can then help them with directly in that space. The dining room, I wish I had a better picture of it. Um, Cause like you mentioned, it does feel more like a cafe and we wanted it to feel that way. We didn't want it to feel like um, institutional for lack of a better word. Um, we wanted it to be that welcoming, inviting space. Um, that Chair, the tables are really small and so we can also lump them together and um, have like so right now when we're just open for the e-beds we have the all the tables in one little area and so we can kind of have a family feel for the youth it doesn't feel like such a big massive space um, but that's where we serve a lot um, all of our meals and so um, we serve breakfast lunch and dinner and then we also have um, it's not in that picture but right now we have our food pantry along that wall too that youth can take the food with them to go um, I think the next picture might be, yep, that's our kitchen. So um, we're very lucky to have a beautiful industrial kitchen that um, can crank out all of these meals because that's one of the largest services that we provide our youth. 
Um, and so, like I said, right now we're just providing those meals just in a to-go form. Um, and so we literally have to-go containers just like restaurants do that we can pack the food for the youth and give it to them um, so it's nice and hot and ready to eat. Um, we also do cooking classes. Uh, that's a really important thing. Um, we talked a lot about self-sufficiency self before. Um, we do cooking classes on um, how to cook with the food that you might get from a food bank or um, just like different ways of cooking the basics like rice or um, how to make a pizza, um, those kind of things, which has been really fun for the youth. Um, the art room, we also do a lot of classes in. Um, we Volunteers have come in and taught classes before. Since we're not able to have volunteers come into the space, we use it a lot now for um, individual art groups. And so um, we can do uh, painting with youth. We've done a lot of collages, things like that. A lot of the youth um, feel like they can connect um, or like with their emotions through art. Um, we were able to do, uh, we did art. Um, that was one of our highest attended therapy groups was our art group um, where they did art journaling. Um, so it's just different fun ways that we can engage with the youth in that space. The laundry room, um, this was oddly the thing I was most excited about when we moved to 612 because laundry is such a big important thing when you're experiencing homelessness. Um, you're already um, have limited amount of clothing with you and um, it's just so important to have fresh clothes when you do anything in life, uh, find a job, uh, just daily, day to day. Um, and so these beautiful industrial washers and dryers have just been wonderful. Um, we do so much laundry um, and uh, we're very thankful to do that for our emergency bed too. Because now we have, we with our individuals living with us, it's also important to wash the bedding and um, the towels from cleaning as well as um, our kitchen stuff. But the laundry room is a very nice addition to a drop-in center. Um, uh, we do, we're very thankful to have gender neutral restrooms. Um, we have four individual restrooms. Um, LGBT youth are disproportionately represented in the homeless population. And so we just really wanted to be very apparent with our support of individuals who identify in that community. Um, and as well as just have those single stall restrooms so the youth can have that privacy and that feeling of safety. Um, so a lot of the youth who are um, staying outside or in other um, adult shelters uh, will shower at our center. Um, we provide all the hygiene supplies, all the towels, um, again, that private safe place that they can take care of that basic need. Important to highlight too that it is a handicapped restroom as well. Um, having that at our facility is obviously key uh, and definitely lacking still today in 2020 at a lot of different community resources. So. We're glad to be able to provide you know that service to those who need it mm -hmm. thank you um and then i always want to highlight to our we do a lot of mobile outreach um there's a lot of great um, community partners who do adult outreach for um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness and um, we work with them very closely because those communities can be really tied together um, but we want to be out there as youth specific outreach to um to help them with um, bringing the supplies to them. So that direct meeting people where they're at and um, providing uh, water bottles, food, batteries, tarps, things like that, um, that we can directly bring to people, build that sense of rapport and that trust, and then they can engage in our drop-in center and then uh, possibly get into our emergency bed program. This is great. Yeah, I talk really fast. And so if there's any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, but that's just the drop-in center portion. And then um, I can definitely let Jamie take over with the e-beds. Yeah. So that's a great graphic, too, because it talks about our emergency bed program, the emergency shelter, which is a 24-7 uh, program. The youth do live there. Some of our youth even have been working overnight shifts or early morning shifts at FedEx and other uh, places in the community that have uh, identified a greater need during COVID. Um, so we're glad to have 24 seven staff on our facility to be able to assist them. Um, like Elizabeth mentioned earlier, sometimes our staff, uh, our participants are coming to us in crisis or in a situation that they haven't found themselves in before. So we're thankful to have a supportive adult in the form of a staff member available to them at all times. Uh, pictured here is actually the main uh, kind of hallway and area in the emergency bed. Uh, room uh, where, again, as we spoke about before, there are nine rooms 
uh, and the uh, emergency bed has two overnight staff who are on a rotation uh, and have a desk uh, pictured here. Uh, and they're able to kind of be available in the evening as the youth are winding down from a long day of working hard or meeting with the staff and trying to uh, figure out the best path, path for them. Uh, and just really thankful, especially uh, for our overnight staff uh, who can be such a great uh, support to these youth that are living in a place that is kind of unknown to them uh, and, in a, and during a time that is especially hard. So just again, really thankful. Um, really, really great, grateful that we can offer an, a, a private room to each youth that does live there. Um, not only does it build a, a, a sense of pride, a place that they can take care of, but it gives them the safety and security again during this uncertain time. Uh, and um, it really helps as staff work to build rapport uh, and just making sure that each one of our participants feels like um, a little bit like they're at home. A lot of them uh, maybe haven't slept in their own bed in some time uh, and just get a sense of uh, respect and dignity when they're receiving services in the, in the eBed programs. Um, the room features uh, obviously an outlet and a little cup hole, having a, a reading light um, and just a, again, that, that sense of security. So is there anything that we don't provide the youth because this is like all over i'm serious it's like over encompassing i mean that was i i've never been through a tour like that 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 was incredible and and the comments that i'm watching right now are are i mean how awesome this is and both jamie and elizabeth you got to feel good about what you're doing i mean you've got to feel good about the service that you're providing but the youth too, the opportunities that this gives them to go forward and, and to work um, and, and to get the job skills, to get the employment skills, to, to get just the know-how. Um, so that is, again, absolutely incredible. And for the folks that watch this, and again, if you are watching it and you have questions and you happen to be live right now, please put in some questions. Uh, we can get to those and answers and answer them. If you're watching uh, later on, please share this video again. So for the folks that are sharing and for the folks that are watching live, if they want to get more involved, what can they do? What, how can folks get involved and, and what can they do to be a part of this? Cause this is, this is awesome. Sure. An easy way to get involved would be uh, visiting our website. Um, are just because of all the services we provide that we've talked about so far, there's always a need for donations and volunteers. Obviously due to COVID-19, there are some restrictions uh, about both of those processes, but we are working uh, with our team to make sure that we can provide those resources, uh, donations and things that we rely on to continue offering these services. I think I'd um, echo that it's been, yeah, our, volunteers and donor have just been so important at this time in providing for uh, what we need to continue to operate. Um, one of my favorite things that I've seen people do is um, figure out how to donate um, experiences for our youth. And um, so we had a volunteer that helped do um, an Easter egg hunt for, for Easter. And they, they, they reached out and they're like, hey, I know like you work with older youth, but would this be of interest? And I was like, yes, who doesn't want to do um, an Easter egg hunt. And it just helps normalize. Um, we've had people help sponsor uh, movie nights with um, snacks and drinks. And um, we had a wonderful donor do, uh, donate a game system that we can. Um, so just kind of figuring out ways that we can help the youth still have those fun uh, kind of normal teenage experiences on top of this pandemic world. Yeah. Um, we're always looking for um, individuals. We've had people help donate um, local food and provide uh sponsor the dinner for the night. Um, that's been really helpful as well. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely check out the website, contact us. We also have our Facebook page. So I think we may have lost our hosts, but uh, we can continue on here for a moment. Um, just to piggyback again off that, some of those great experiences we've provided. Um, another way, great way to get involved in your community is just sharing these videos. Uh, it's a great way to talk about the resources that our organization provides. 
uh, not just at Iowa Homeless Youth Centers uh, and in Des Moines, but for YSS in general and across our communities and state. So let me and let me capture real quick. There was a, a comment, a question, I guess. Um, how long do youth typically stay in the EBED program? So, Jamie, that would be coming to you. Sure. So um, every youth is different and that's so important to capture, but also to respect. Uh, and everyone is going to have a different need. But that being said, um, youth typically would stay in the emergency bed program for 30 or 60 days uh, as they transition and execute their self-sufficiency plan. Um, but that's not to say youth haven't stayed there for shorter or longer. Um, our staff take pride in um, you know, being competent and knowing about community resources. And that starts with the questions that we ask. Um, there are skills like diversion uh, and um, Oh um, man, there's another one, Elizabeth, that I can't put <laughs> off my head. You're good. Just keep going. Uh, uh, diversion and things of that nature, which are <laughs> um, asking questions like, "Do you have any supportive adults in your life? Maybe okay. a friend or a family member um, who you, whom you trust and, and might have a place where you can stay um, for 90 days or more while you get back up on your feet." You know, so if our staff are trained in asking these important questions and finding you know, unique path for these youth to find a safe and secure place while they, um, you know, carve out their own path towards self-sufficiency. That's how we have success. Um, we rely heavily on having trained staff and our community resources. Awesome. And, and Elizabeth, anything you want to add on there? Because you were talking about, and I, again, this kind of blew my mind when you were talking about donating experiences. Mm -hmm. And if I, I had never really thought about that before, but you know, if experiences have really helped change your life and have helped you, you could cash in on that again, to use that phrase and, and throw it out there to, to these other youth. And so I'm going to ask both of you, if folks want to contribute with their experiences, we know that we need finances. We know that we need resources, definitely. Um, where do they go again? And I see some comments about this. So I wanted to kind of highlight that about, about where folks can go. Yeah, it'd be um, our websites there on the screen. That's probably the best way to start. Our main number is also answered 24 seven. So that's a good, that'll um, okay. uh, be an easy way to access. We have a great development team who can help coordinate all of those uh, donation requests. Um, we are still uh, accepting donations at our drop-in center. Um, we just meet you at the door and accept them and bring them in. So, yep, all of it mm -hmm. is still running and functioning. Easy, simple, easy. I mean, hey, I can't remember even, Jamie, what I came and dropped off. I think it was some masks and it was some, yeah. and if I wasn't insisting on getting in there to see the <laughs> awesome facility, which I was like, I was even like trying to show my YSS badge and stuff in case Jamie didn't know exactly, I mean, let me in. <laughs> and and it was great, um, but it's easy. It's simple for folks. And I also see the yss.org uh, backslash get involved. Um, that, that can be a site. So again, 612 Locust Street in Des Moines, uh, 50309. And folks can also mail you if they're into that handwritten letter thing, they can mail you, right? A request or mm -hmm. for some more information um, and, mm -hmm. and check that out. And, or you can email IHYC at YSS.org. Um, all of these, all of these, the, again, folks cannot encourage you to get involved enough in this. So before I let you go, Jamie or Elizabeth, yes, I saw that finger there, Jamie. Yeah. Talk, talk. Yes. I have one more, one more uh, opportunity to get involved, you know, yeah. we, uh, eventually open up our space as we deem it a safe uh, space um, due, just due to COVID-19. As we open up, we're gonna be inviting volunteers back into our space. A great opportunity for volunteering is actually donating your time and skills as well. In the past, we've even had a uh, yoga instructor donating their time to provide that as a great mental health uh, and, and just general health stress relief. Um, but also folks could donate their time by coming in and teaching computer literacy or tutoring uh, for different programs. We have a lot of youth still navigating high school, but also uh, in college and trying to navigate classes like organic chemistry, which I drew pictures in, um, you know, and donating not just 
donating experiences, but donating your time and skills to, to people who need it in your community. That's a great way to access our space and, and volunteer here at uh, YSS and Iowa Homeless Youth Centers. And I, I, oh my goodness. I mean, you said organic chemistry? Yeah. Holy cow. Okay. You just made my brain hurt right there <laughs> with organic chemistry and just thinking, yes, I mean, just the need for tutors and the need for folks to come in with math, with science, with, I mean, all of these different skills that we know that we have in the community um, from the folks around that can come in. And like you were talking uh, yoga, um, what are, real quick before I let you go, what are some other creative things that people have brought just to get folks kind of, folks kind of spinning here to think about what they can contribute? Um, one of my favorites was we got a mini trampoline uh, it was the best. Uh, it is now broken because uh, yeah. a lot of teenagers jumping on it can break it. But um, <laughs> that's uh, don't need 20 of those. But it was a really fun, um, again, just a fun thing to, to pass the time and a good exercise. Um, we have had um, we thought of the idea of like picnics or things like that. So, again, we could kind of go out with the youth and still uh, do social distancing um, those, uh, kind of experiences as well that we could do with the youth. Awesome. And, and again, if folks want to know more about this, you can definitely go to yss.org. Um, you can find out all the information about this. I want to say a, a real big, again, huge thanks to Elizabeth Pant uh, Patton. She is a youth opportunity center program manager and also Jamie uh, Yaller, the Emergency Bed Program Coordinator yeah. um, for IHYC. And you, I can't thank you both for everything that you've done, the lives that you've changed, the lives that you are changing, and, and the generations that will change because of this. Um, so next week, I, I want to invite everybody to tune in again, 7 p.m. here, uh, YSS Let's Talk Live every single uh Thursday, 7 p.m. Here we have up on the screen what's coming up uh, next week. So Child Welfare and Emergency Services and Dr. Jen Hansen. We also have Shonda Hansen, Nicholas um, Detterman, and of course myself uh, hosting. Please tune in. The most important thing is if you're watching this, share this because this is awesome information, great information to get out there, free information. And if you want to know any more, please visit as simple as www.yss.org. Jamie, Elizabeth, any final words? Because you're awesome. That's my final words. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we got a question from the community. Oh. We want to touch on it. Um, yes. So there's a question whether we will be having Reggie sleep out uh, or not this year. Uh, from my understanding, Reggie's sleep out is going to look a little bit different, but will still be occurring. So make sure to our Des Moines and Ames communities to stay tuned and find out more about what Reggie's uh, sleep out is going to look like. Uh, more details to follow on June 15th. So hopefully on one of uh, these Let's, Let's Talk series, we can uh, share more information about what that might look like. Uh, but we're excited to be able to continue that really important event uh, highlighting uh, experiences, um, you know, of our youth, uh, and making sure we're in involving the community in the process. And for those that don't know, uh, what you're talking about that might be watching about Reggie's sleep, out, which is one of uh, the largest activities of its kind throughout the state, possibly even the Midwest nation, uh, Jamie or Elizabeth, can you real quick, uh, in like, uh, I don't know, 15 seconds capture what Reggie, that's not possible, but Re Reggie's sleep out is. Yeah, for sure. Um, Reggie Sleep Out started um, in honor of Reggie Kelsey, who passed away um, experiencing homelessness after he aged out of the foster care system. Um, so Reggie Sleep Out started in as a way of our being able to memorialize um, and uh, start that momentum to try to have that never happen again. So keeping the education going, keeping the conversations going about how we can best wrap around services for our young adults to make sure that they don't have um, negative outcomes. So how can we um, individualize our services? And so Reggie Sleep Out, we um, literally go and sleep outside and try to have a little bit of that experience of what it would be like. Um, we usually hold it when it's cold, um, October or November. And so you can kind of feel what it would feel like to sleep outside and hopefully 
um, kind of build that empathy and understanding for individuals experiencing about experiencing homelessness. And awesome. And I've been a part of Reggie's sleep at once and it was cold that I, yeah. with you. Um, but it was, there was a concert going on. There was so mm -hmm. much stuff that just united everybody. But the biggest part was kind of that unity and the education. And this was probably goodness. 15 years ago, was it possibly 12 years? It's been going on for a mm -hmm. long time. So if folks want to know about Reggie's Sleep Out again and what's going on there, um, the easiest way to go, and here I go again, www.yss.org. That is the place to find out all the information about all of this. So, okay, I don't see any other questions or live comments now I am looking. So Jamie, thank you so much. Elizabeth, thank you. And for all those that are watching, please share and make sure that you tune in uh, next Thursday, 7 p.m. for YSS Let's Talk. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.